Hey folks, today is going to be savage. We are launching a new YouTube channel. I'm getting together with two of my friends, Connor Shorten and Yannick Kilcher, and we're launching this channel and it's gonna be called Machine Learning Street Talk. My name is Connor Shorten. I'm working on my PhD in computer science at Florida Atlantic University with a focus on machine learning. I'm making machine learning research summary videos and the occasional coding tutorial on Henry AI Labs. I'm also chatting with fellow machine learning YouTubers, Yannick Kilcher and Tim Scarf on Machine Learning Street Talk. Machine learning research moves incredibly fast, and I personally appreciate it when there is a video out that can help me get an idea of the paper before I try to read it. Hopefully you'll find these videos useful for educating yourself on what's really going on in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Hi, I'm Yannick. I'm a guy on the internet with opinions, most of them questionable. I'm a PhD student by day, but at night I run a YouTube channel. On my channel, I try to analyze and explain the best, greatest and latest research papers. If you like the conversation today, head over to my channel and subscribe and you'll get much, much more. Enjoy. Now, I almost don't need to explain what Machine Learning Street Talk is. The clues in the name, right? Every week we're gonna to get together and we are going to talk about the latest and greatest in machine learning research. And also we're going to invite several experts from industry and academia to help us do this. Now, um, a little bit about me. Um, I've got a PhD in machine learning. Uh, I was a principal machine learning engineer at Microsoft for the last three years. And now I'm the chief AI architect at BP. I've been following Connor for just over a year now. He launched his um, Henry AI Labs YouTube channel and the guy is a machine. I can't believe the pace that he manages to push content out because I always had the mindset of looking at, you know, quite seminal papers and some of the, um, you know, big contributions, but somehow Connor manages to stay on the very, very cutting edge and, uh, and just maintain that velocity. So it's incredible. I've, uh, I've been in, uh, aware of uh, Yannick for about uh, probably 12 to 18 months as well. And when I was interviewing for the Bing team, I needed to learn all about how transformer models worked. And there was a dearth of information out there because no one really seemed to understand it, to be honest. And Yannick has this incredible style of explaining things on, on his YouTube channel. He goes through the paper methodically and he explains things in a way that anyone can understand. It's a real talent, to be honest. And someone always said to me once that, you know, in order to explain something simply, you have to understand it very, very well. And, uh, and and I think Yannick is, is, a, is a great testament to that. So for the last year or so on my own YouTube channel, uh, The Machine Learning Dojo, I've been running a series called Paper Review Calls, which is a way to um, talk about the latest and greatest in machine learning research. And uh, I had several of the primary authors come and talk about their research. And I suppose I kind of see this channel as, as a continuation of that series. So today's call, we're going to talk about Uber's recent paper, The Enhanced Poet, open-ended reinforcement learning through unbounded invention of learning challenges and their solutions by Wang et al. Now, um, this paper, it introduces a new paradigm of machine learning, uh, which is kind of um, called AI generating algorithms or, or open-endedness. And open-endedness is the, the class of algorithms that generates problems and solutions of increasing diversity and complexity complexity. And there's a bit of a parallel here with curriculum learning, because the thing is with curriculum learning is that complex tasks become tractable if they are the last stepping stone in a sequence of learning tasks. And uh, in, in this uh, paper, it, it describes a methodology for creating that curriculum um, automatically. Now, this is a, a nice narrative point here because there's a real progression in machine learning moving away from handcrafted expert systems. Originally, people used to have to write code to do things. Increasingly, as we embrace machine learning, we could rely on algorithms to kind of create those rules for us. And some of the algorithms still had fixed objectives. They had a fixed domain and they had handcrafted inductive priors encoded into the algorithm. And what we're seeing with, with open-endedness is a real step away from that, allowing the algorithms themselves to generate challenges and, and, and solutions to that. But you know, there's lots of challenges in, in this as well. So determining the right stepping stones in the correct order is notoriously difficult. And we need to encode novel challenges of appropriate difficulty so that we don't destroy the gradient of, of uh, improvement. 
Now, the concept of open-endedness, uh, it draws a lot of inspiration from evolution. And uh, if, if you think about it, um, evolution has produced our own intelligence. And the interesting thing about evolution is it doesn't converge. It just goes on forever. With traditional machine learning algorithms, you would train them and they would converge. Whereas open-endedness is something which could potentially just go on forever because you could just keep creating new problems and solutions and there's no end in sight. So the other thing is with fixed domain machine learning, uh, the algorithms will only ever be as good as the humans because the humans come up with the challenges. If you allow these algorithms to generate their own uh, challenges, then effectively they might find solutions and strategies which are even better uh, than humans. So there's a real thing here that um, it's interesting to be able to solve challenges that we don't even know about yet. Anyway, this is exciting times. Um, I hope you enjoy uh, today's session. Remember to like, comment and subscribe and hit that notification bell and we will see you back next week. So here we are. This is the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel. And today uh, we are here to talk about the POET, well, the Enhanced POET paper, the uh, paired uh, open-ended trailblazer. And uh, we have a whole bunch of folks in the house. So let's do a round of introductions. Let's start with you, Connor. Okay, uh, my name is Connor Shorten. I'm working on my PhD in computer science and making machine learning YouTube videos at Henry AI Labs. And Matthew? Uh, hi, I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm currently a research scientist working in computer vision. And Keith? You're on mute. Yep, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Can you see my video now, by the way? Yeah, we, we can All see right. you. All right, I hope that's... Hope, but <laughs> yeah, it's on. So, um, I'm Keith. I got my PhD years and years ago, so I used to be smart, but not anymore. And uh, <laughs> now I work at Microsoft as a principal technology strategist and yeah. just uh, have an interest in this kind of thing. Awesome. And Eric? Uh, hi, well, I'm Eric. I'm a software engineer and I um, work a lot on machine learning on side projects. That's it. And Yannick? I'm Yannick. I am a PhD student and I also make videos explaining, trying to explain papers. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, this, uh, this poet paper, it's, it's a really exciting new paradigm of artificial intelligence. It's, you know, it's uh, artificial intelligence generating, because I suppose in, in the olden days, we would have a, a fixed domain and we would train a machine learning model to do a particular task. Oh, here's Dimitri joining. Hello, Dimitri. We've just kicked off. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, hello. Uh, so I uh, work at Microsoft. I used to work with team um, and doing some research, some projects with European clients. And now uh, I'm cloud developer advocate. And I'm looking forward to this call. Cool. Fantastic. So, yes, that was uh, Dr. Soshnikov in the house. Good stuff. So, uh, yeah, Yannick, why, why don't you um, kick off the conversation? Then? So, so this is a, a new type of algorithm that can generate simultaneous uh, new problems and solutions continuously. Yeah, so what, what always fascinated me uh, in this work is I first heard about this kind of work when I attended a tutorial by uh, Jeff Kloon and Kenneth O. Stanley at a conference. I don't remember which. I think it was ICML. And um, <clears throat> the quote that struck me most was, if you think about life on Earth and kind of the, the vast diversity that of life that exists, this is just from a single run of an optimization process. It's not like in machine learning where we optimize and hyper tune and start again and, and so on. This is just a single run of a process that produced all of this all of this diversity and complexity, a single open-ended run. And that is what I find extremely cool and, and, and capturing in a way. And this, this new paradigm kind of in, it wants to go that way. It wants to build algorithms that run for a long time and are open-ended. And basically means they want to create agents that live in worlds, but both of them continuously evolve. So the agents get better 
at kind of solving the worlds, but the worlds shift as the agents get better. And therefore you get a kind of a branching out and diverse diverse uh, range of, of, of agents. And it turns out in this way, you can get much, much, much more competent agents for solving the kinds of problems that you want to solve than if you were to go classic reinforcement learning, just I want to uh, do solve this problem. So in the in these poet examples, they have this walker, right? They have this two two feet bipedal walker. And the goal is just to get to the right as sorry, to the right as far as possible. And um, <clears throat> If you were just to go about this with RL, there's lots and lots and lots of hurdles that we don't know yet how to solve. But if you go about this with this evolutionary way, where you create worlds and you mutate them and the agents continuously evolve, uh, it turns out this problem suddenly becomes one that is solvable. So there's a bit of a parallel here with curriculum learning. But I suppose the difference is this is a curriculum which, rather than being handcrafted, is one which is learned continuously. And um, the good thing about this, uh, you, you know, this thing is that you can solve really complex tasks. But but some complex tasks only become tractable, you know, if they're the final stepping stone, you know, in a sequence of of learning tasks. So it, it's about having challenges which are um, increasingly uh, more difficult and and more, more diverse. Yes. So yeah. curriculum learning uh, it, it refers to kind of the what you said, you want to kind of build up the complexity of your problem incrementally such that your agents that are trying to solve the problem can always profit from the last step. What well, these people, these people make the argument that this is not enough often. What you need in their um, argumentation are these kind of stepping stone um, goal switching things. So, so goal switching is a big part of poet and of this whole line of work is where if you evolve very different kinds of environments, it might turn out that what you learn over here in one type of environment, all of a sudden becomes useful in another type. And in such a way you couldn't have learned it. You couldn't have directly learned that skill in, for example, if there's a huge cliff, right? You couldn't, just make the cliff bigger and bigger and bigger. And at some point you're going to fail. But if over here you have some sort of higher and higher stairs, the skill of transferring these stairs might all of a sudden be useful in jumping down the cliff. So in this poet paper and the extended poet, they demonstrate very in a very cool way how these different skills can be transferred between the agents and thereby you can overcome challenges that curriculum learning in the classic sense cannot. Um, that's, that's really I, interesting. The, oh, I'm sorry, go on. No, um, I, and I agree with, completely agree with the perspective. I see it slightly differently as well, though. Um, so usually in evolutionary algorithms and genetic programming, one of the biggest frustrations is that, you know, you carry out mutation and mutation seems to work. But, you know, when you're kind of like doing recombination or crossover, things fall apart because it's very hard to take two pieces together and get them to fit. Now, I view the, the uh, agent and the environment as being part of one genome. And what's really nice is that you can split the genome at the point of the agent and split the genome at the point of the environment and they still work. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I view it slightly as a nice way of doing recombination um, because you still can pull the agent from like one genome and put them in another and it kind of works. Um, so I completely agree with your points, but I like the, I, in my mind, I like that view that you basically are achieving recombina good recombination by allowing to kind of separate the genome into kind of the agent and the environment. Well, I, I, but I want to interject there because why am I getting an echo? Sorry, let me fix this. No, don't. Uh, we can't hear um, you now. You're on, you're on mute, Keith. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry about that. I'm dealing with two systems. Anyway, if I understood the algorithm correctly, from my point of view, there's there's almost zero recombination that's happening. There is no recombination, it, yes. Yeah, because what it's doing is it's just taking the best, you know, it's it's a it's a zero one loss function. Are you better than you become the new model for that environment? And that's kind of one of the concerns I have about this approach is you're going to wind up at the end with a list of several AIs that are that are great at subsets of environments. 
and yet we still have no way whatsoever to actually combine those to cover a very general, you know, complete set of environments. I, well, I think I, the idea that, oh, sorry, uh, I think the idea he was presenting is that you can't have an agent that is like super performant without the environment. So that's why I think this recombination idea is an interesting way of looking at it. I never thought about it that way before, but like you can't have some agent that performs super well unless it's necessarily coupled with an environment. So that's, I think that's an interesting way of looking at it that, well, yeah, like you can't, you have, they have to evolve together. And that's why I think the recombination idea is a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Could I ask a question as well? Because the paper talks a lot about goal switching and it also talks about, you know, a contrast to traditional evolutionary algorithms, which can be thought of as black box optimizers. And, you know, the the objective is fixed. But in some sense, the objective is fixed here, because as I understand it, the objective is to go from the left hand side to the right hand side as as quickly as possible. Uh, So in some sense, when you talk about goal switching, you're actually talking about um, switching to different environments. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's still optimizing towards a goal, uh, but the kind of point of the kind of guided evolution is not necessarily to always go towards the goal. It's kind of to explore the area as much as possible. And that's why they kind of talks about novelty. And this is Ken Stanley's work has mainly been around novelty um, uh, for a very, very long time. So this is definitely like the kind of area that he's very much interested in. So like undirected um, kind of goalless exploration but it does come to the kind of you know question of you know if you had a space which was much much larger uh, you can't possibly explore everything so how do you be be able to exploit it so i think the 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 key part the key cool things about uh poet and enhanced poet are fantastic to being able to kind of achieve these uh, almost seemingly impossible tasks. Uh, But at the same time, in many other real world applications where the dimensionality is so much higher, uh, they would struggle because you'd have to have like unlimited compute in order to be able to make them tractable. I mean, could you you just um, riff on that just for a second, uh, Matt? So what what is it in particular about the POET formulation? Is it because the the way that the environments are generated and parameterized is, is limited? Yeah, so at, the, at this moment in time, there's, there's only yeah, so much variety that you can have within this kind of very specific environment. And if you think about it, the bipedal walker has only got like like four joints, <laughs> etc. It's really, it's a very limited environment. So therefore, it becomes computationally tractable in the computation that we have today. Now, if you took something that's a little bit more complicated, I'm pretty sure that you'd see that it would just be impossible to solve within any kind of realistic time frame. Um, so I think the kind of idea of being able to explore an area is fantastic. What you'd want to be able to do is to do it even more sample efficiently, uh, to be able to do it with even less examples, to be able to do it without necessarily having to sample the environment, but to have some way to be able to say, oh, that's that's you know really you know, kind of important to me. Um, well, I think the in the the sample efficiency, in my opinion, you know, I think what I was saying earlier that there's no recombination; it's this delta loss zero or one. I think we're losing information there. Right. Oh, like if we're, all, if we're only keeping the very best model for an environment and totally ignoring like every other model's contribution, you know, there's an information loss there. And like I said, I got my PhD a long time ago. So I, I keep, when I was watching Yannick's video, I kept thinking, how much of what he's saying could I phrase in the context of like an old school contour map where I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to fall down this valley. So I'm going to keep the annealing temperature high so I can jump over it into a different area and maybe find the global, the global optimum that's over here. It's like, this is a genetic algorithm. Like to me, there was like so little new, actually, I'm struggling to see why it's considered so novel. And, and I just see information loss like at every step in the algorithm. So that was my concern. Yeah. Well, I think I, the, I mean, exactly. the information I, loss. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I think the information loss isn't too bad because you have this population of the agents, and that's why I think it's so important that this is a population of agents, not and they're not optimized with say uh, policy gradients, and it's not the same agent with po- policy gradients in the same model, but rather you are using evolutionary strategies optimization. So I think that's yeah. how you don't lose too much information because you maintain the diversity in the controllers of the agent. I'm yeah, just saying there are these competing. There are these competing you know, processes. There is information loss. Yes, there's a population of agents, but there are a population of specialized agents, agents that become specialized to their particular environment and only by happenstance may actually work in another environment. So there's there's just there's some cross crosstalk and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and or what specific avenues there are to bridge these gaps, these information gaps. 
So yeah. I think the, the authors, whenever they, they talk about it, they always kind of draw the parallels to, to real life and to this evolutionary process of real life. And I think you have the same thing there where you have a niche that's kind of occupied by a species, mm -hmm. but then maybe it slightly changes, right? And then all of a sudden another species is better and just completely wipes out the first species, right? It's not the most efficient, like you could think of, let's take the best of both species, but that's not what happens usually. What happens is that this species comes in, dominates and wipes out this other whole entire yeah. line of, 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 of life, right? So, and that's the look that's at the I end think, result. Yeah. We wind up with yeah. millions of specialized species, right? And and a bacterium's flagellum has very little information that can help me with my leg. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this, um, this contrast to evolution is really interesting because the, the original Uber uh, uh, blog post talked about this. It said that evolution has invented um, astronomical complexity for an eternity, and it's an open-ended process in, in much the same way. And indeed, evolution has produced um, human-level uh, intelligence. But what's so fascinating is, is a lot of um, optimization algorithms before have converged, but this continuous um, process that does, does make it different. But in evolution, there, there seems to be that the, the, the optimization objective is, is still fixed. Uh, you know, in real evolution, it's not fixed, but, but in, in this algorithm, um, it is fixed. So there is still a, a bit of a difference. I mean, could you kind of contrast them? The, 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 I think it's, it's nice to make the connection before with what you said. What is the difference to classic, let's say, evolutionary algorithm or, or curriculum learning is that they usually have a goal, right? There is like if you imagine there is a test set of environments that we want this agent to perform well, like in supervised learning, we have a test test set, right? And you could imagine this here, like we have a test set, like these five environments, you need to perform well on them is not really set that this poet algorithm would perform well on those. It will just it kind of has no goal as opposed to these other algorithms. They are trying to achieve a certain goal with this evolutionary method. But the poet algorithm, it just it has this kind of goal of going to the right, but it keeps inventing new environments that is that are harder and harder and harder. And it becomes more about creating novel things. And th yeah. this is what I find a bit uh, if like they evaluate this against these classic algorithms and the environments they tested on are the environments that they themselves came up with yes. so naturally <laughs> are the environments that they are able to solve. And then they show all oh, these other algorithms aren't able to solve those. <laughs> right. Whereas yeah. I think the fairer comparison would be if, if there was kind of a preset test set of hard environments where you say, OK, these are to be solved. Yeah. Right. I mean, that yeah. it's it, it's it's a research focus, right? I'm I come from this classic world where you need to push the metric and get state of the art, and they come from a world where they just want to let this algorithm run, and then they see, and they they, they basically the result is, wow, look what it did. Yeah. I so I, can I make I want to make one Sorry, comment though about about sort of this this concept that let's say older school, let's just say simulated annealing, like doesn't have a changing environment. I want to point out like a possible connection for, for you younger, smarter folks when you go to do research on this. So let's say I got this contour map and I'm trying to find the global minimum, right? In simulated annealing, you have this temperature component, which is basically how far do I jump in the direction of the gradient, right? And the higher the temperature, the further I go. Now, what's interesting is when the temperature is very high, local structure is just not relevant because all these higher order derivatives and whatnot, they mm -hmm. just end up not mattering because I jump like straight over them, right? Mm -hmm. As it starts to cool down, all that local structure and detail starts to become important. And I see that parallel to what's the same thing that's happening in Poet, which is I start off with this kind of smooth environment and it doesn't really even have any local structure rather than I have local structure, but I'm ignoring it and simulating and kneeling. And it becomes rougher and rougher. That's analogous to as I cool down, all this local structure starts to matter. So there may be kind of like a very elegant sort of parametric way almost to, mm -hmm. to, to frame that so that you can start to take more advantage of all the rich information content. Right. I, I think what you're describing is kind of the genius behind the compositional pattern producing network that's encoding these environments now instead of the original quote paper with the handcrafted heuristics like you know, frequency of obstacles, height of the obstacles, depth of the, you know, ditches in the map. 
So I, I think this compositional pattern producing network, it parameterizes the environment in such a space that you can do something like uh, simulated annealing where you globally jump dramatically, where I think the handcrafted feature environment can't do that dramatic of a global jump. And that's what I think is so interesting about poet to the enhanced poet. And then, as you mentioned earlier, going into, you know, like supervised learning problems, like really not just bipedal walking agents where like the most dramatic environment you can imagine would be like an uphill and maybe like a drop set to just break like that. You know, climbing like, trees. Think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that compositional pattern producing network is such an interesting component of this new paper and how you do global structure jumps. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of um, uh, things to talk about here as well. So the, the, in general, I like this narrative that it, software started off as, as handcrafted rules. And increasingly, human beings are being used uh, for less and less handcrafted um you know, features in the system. So even when we had uh, deep learning, for example, yes, features were learned as part of the training process, but there were so many inductive priors hard-coded into the architecture. And even uh, even this is interesting. So we get onto reinforcement learning and, and curriculum learning, and now we're, we're trusting the machine to learn the curriculum. So in, in general, we seem to be moving along this path where we're trusting the machine more and more to create the rules. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, but we see that everywhere, right? So, you know, GANs, they're hugely successful, specifically for that reason is because we don't have to kind of handcraft, you know, the data set for them. They just figure it out. Um, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning. I think everything is going in this general direction um, of being able to, to an extent, it, being able to uh, gather the proper examples that would give it the the, the correct solution. Um, I think what the poet paper and the has poet paper does differently though is it's basically saying there is no way to kind of optimize this in in a GAN sense or in a reinforcement learning sense. I have to do something that's a bit more open-ended. And this open-ended exploration will allow me to arrive at solutions that I would not be it would not be possible for me to arrive through other means. Now, maybe in the future, someone will come along and say there was a way to use this optimization method to achieve something similar to Poet. But I don't think that's the point. I think the point is, you know, of achieving results without being able to have like um, where either the gradients or other information would be misleading. And, and you touched on the point there as well, because it, I think the, the Uber blog post said that it turns out that unknown problems can be extremely useful, especially if they're safety related um, uh, edge cases, you know, in, in autonomous driving, for example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this um, brings me on to, to another interesting point as well, which is the the, the concept of, of intelligence in general um, and even um, artificial general intelligence. Because if you took one of these uh, bipedal uh, agents and you placed them in another completely different environment, they would would be completely useless. But but it raises this philosophical question about intelligence because Francois Chalet, the man, the legend, he uh, has he has something to say about this and, and he wrote an interesting paper which I think is is on the is it called on the measure of intelligence? We're, we're gonna do a discussion about that uh, uh, soon, I hope. But his big thing is that he doesn't believe that an explosion in, in, in intelligence is even possible. We shouldn't be worried about artificial general intelligence because intelligence is expressed as a function. It's it's a, an expression of the of the environment environment in which the agent lives. And this seems like a perfect example of that. Well, I think it's about the product of the search. Like if the poet algorithm is developing like a neural controller mapping input to output, like this kind of tastes like a topology. It's like a neural architecture search and that's the product of the search. And then that might be able to generalize to like the Atari suite or something. But it's not to say because the inputs are so different, but yeah, I think it's about the product of the search. And then again, to this idea of the agent and the environment are necessarily coupled, as you mentioned. You can't like separate one out. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think if I if I understood correctly, I think the if by the product of the search, do we mean the actual structure of the intelligence that we end up creating? Is that? Yeah. Right, so right, I, right. I, I totally agree with that because, um, you know, since we're talking about evolution, let's think about the fact that I think the number is about 25,000 is the number of genes that we suspect, you know, human beings have, right? And of course, it's super hard to translate that into any type of, let's say, comparable parameter, uh, you know, information complexity or whatever. I'm not sure anybody really knows how to do that yet. But the point is, that's a pretty small number, at least in a sense, when you think about the complexity of, of, of these algorithms or the 
intelligence that we're trying to create here, right? Like just the numbers of parameters and like the complexity of structures. So I think I think at some point we're going to discover that the key to generalizability is simplicity, i.e. parsimony. And we have to find some way, whatever that is, you know, nonlinear neural networks, I don't know, of having far more parsimonious intelligences that we're trying to optimize. Yes, I mean, I did a paper review call with Matthew uh, the, the other week, and that was about the lottery ticket hypothesis. And uh, I mean, uh, I, I, could, I think Matthew can talk to this much, much better than me. So, so go ahead. Uh, well, that's a very good point. I wasn't actually thinking of that, but it, exactly to your point is, you know, if you think of how many neurons you have in your brain, you exceed, you know, there's not enough genes for you to be able to encode them. Absolutely. So there definitely has to be some process that happens um, after the, the kind of agent is created that allows for this to kind of happen. Um, yeah. And there's obviously a lot of stuff by Yeshua Benji, obviously relating more to, um, you know, what's the idea of consciousness and why do we require attention and why is our short-term memory so limited, uh, calling like an information bottleneck. And having information bottlenecks seems to be a, a important uh, generally through many kind of um, things that we observe in, in nature, but also kind of we find it to be important in machine learning models as well. You know, we always try to project some, some latent space. Um, um, right. Now, how now the question is is um i'm not a geneticist um and so therefore being able to say you know what genes are important and how the process of genes and whether the information in genes to be able to encode intelligence is there uh that's a difficult question to answer i feel um and yeah, maybe maybe we are able to kind of uh, discover something with far fewer genes because um, or far fewer, fewer pieces of information because uh, evolution is not um, an efficient process. Uh, you know, if you look, take yeah. it, the, what human is like, our eyes are, are uh, incorrectly wired. Um, we have well, blood maybe, vessels going on top of the retina. Uh, you know, we maybe, maybe you know, not. A lot of that is sometimes just lack of imagination. You know, people figure out later that there's actually a good reason for structural components. No, 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 no. The cephalopods, oh, have, better no, eyes. No, no, no. cephalopods have better eyes than us. Yeah, but it's better in what environment is what I'm saying. So, for example, when I was a PhD student, it was there was all this talk about junk DNA. See all this junk DNA. It's there. It turns out it's not junk. Right. Yes, so I'm just saying a lot of times we're arguing from ignorance. But I think um, so well, something to think about. And this is where, you know, and maybe this is already happening. And, and I don't know because I, I'm not an expert in this field. But what I'm talking about is let's suppose I look at, at neural networks and I looked at neural networks that were successful across a variety of problems. Do people actually ever dive in and try to look for structures that are being created within those networks? I mean, look, we keep seeing these seven nodes that keep arranging here. And actually what they're doing is computing a second order derivative. And so maybe we should just incorporate a layer that computes second order derivatives like much more efficiently. Does anybody put any effort into that? Like really diving in to look for common low level structures? Your neural architectural search is kind of around that. And you see a lot of stuff around that, both evolving, I think more recently DeepMind did an evolution of a different type of uh, normalization layer. Um, but these types of things do come about from neural architecture search. Um, so people do, but again, it still depends on the data set that you optimize towards, right? I think to that point is like with these BERT models and examining the attention patterns in the BERT models, I think to unify kind of what we're talking about is the big problem with say taking POET and then playing Atari with it is that you have to figure out how to map that input domain. And those, you know, the angular velocity on the hip joint of the bipedal walking agent doesn't make any sense to transfer yeah. to something like the images and some kind of input modality unifying function that's complex as hell. You're never going to figure out that. So that's why I like, you know, within natural language processing, they have the same input domain, you know, these byte pair encoding tokenized words. They have all these different tasks, question answering, summarization, natural language inference, you know, name density recognition, blah, blah, blah. And then they have this BERT model and they're, you know, slamming BERT on, you know, pre-training it and then fine tuning it on all these different tasks. And that's where I think they're trying to look at this underlying what kind of attention pattern arises in all of these tasks. Like what is BERT looking at in natural language inference? What's it looking at in summarization? So I guess that's kind of maybe the best, I th I'd say that's the best area of research in like interpretability that's out there. I don't think vision has a similar analog as like inspecting the attention patterns of birth. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. And Matthew, what did you call that? It's called, it was called neural what structure? Just... Your, uh, neural architecture search. Okay, thank you. NAS. 
But if we're, if we're trying to maybe go back to the, the question of intelligence or something like this, um, the, the problem with mapping this and, and something like Poet is, is exactly that. If you, if you think of the latter of where what you said before, Tim, is we started, you know, solving puzzles ourselves and then we know exactly what's going on. Right. And then we start building programs and then we don't know the compiler does something weird, but we still write the code. And then we, you know, we do neural networks. And now we know the input output, but we don't know what happens in between. And with GANs, we don't know what's yeah. coming out. We just know yeah. it, it looks good, right? And, and <laughs> so we're giving away more and more freedom of the out, over the output by acquiring more and more power. And now with Poet, um, I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm skeptical it, whether or not it's going to create intelligence. All we can say is, is like, let's say this is the most powerful algorithm if we had the compute. All we can say is that it's going to create something very interesting, right? Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the statement that this is going to be intelligence is, uh, is very questionable unless you have some mathematical theorem that the most interesting thing is actually intelligence, right? It's, all of the most interesting things will always end up at intelligence. If that's not given, right? It could, it, it mm -hmm. will produce something like super interesting because mm -hmm. that's what it's designed to do, but it, it's not designed to achieve a goal, right? Yes. That's so, funny. A mathematical definition of intelligence as interesting. I like, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> well, well, maybe, right? Maybe, maybe. that maybe there, there's know. like a, a, an argument to be made that it, it, whatever, if you find the most interesting thing in any direction, it is always going to be intelligent. Like the computer vision people, they have the, the point at infinity. Right, it, right. Where, where all the lines cross, and uh, yeah. But like the, 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 basically, the, the open-ended the, algorithm won't won't end up at it at the goal that you would like it to end up at. No, most probably. Agree. No, no, definitely not. But I think that's the that's the point. I think that they're making um, is that there is it's just open-ended. It just explores and hopefully reveals something interesting. I think something that's remarkable about the open endedness is that it still produces like a viciously complex terrain at the end. And I think the whole selling point of the paper is, look, we produce a terrain and you cannot use evolutionary strategies or PPO to get something that can do this otherwise. Yeah. So I think like to relate it back to the generative adversarial network idea, it's like, would the agent be the generator and the environment be the discriminator or would the agent be the generator discriminator coupled? And then the environment is the data set that they're using underneath. And so we think about like that data set becoming a complex terrain, even though it's so high dimensional that running that experiment would probably be impossible. You could imagine that it comes up with some data set that it produces some image, video, audio, you know, whatever domain is interesting to you, like say a video, you know, say it writes a movie and it, it, that's the complex terrain that comes out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think also to your point, though, is that, you know, once you've ran Poet to get to some point, okay, you can then say, okay, this agent, what path did it take? And that curriculum that it took mm. becomes deterministic. Because then you go, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to train it from here to here. Mm. And I think that's the, that's also another important concept is that the information of each training step throughout this kind of hierarchy isn't lost because the agent is the, the you know transferring this information on because it doesn't start from zero. It is kind of kept its training from the previous rounds. And so I think it's a way of discovering a, a novel pathway. Mm -hmm. um, so... so Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I I thought the result at any point at any step of this algorithm is it's a population of agents, right? That yep. perform best in some subset of the of the domain. So I'm just curious from a practical perspective. Suppose I'm trying to use you know POA to train whatever uh, an algorithm to, to to do bipedal motion in a general environment, and I run my algorithm for a while, and I use Azure and have tons of compute, and at the end. I've got five agents. What do I do now? Like, which one, you know, which one should I deploy to my robot? I guess is my question. And or should, is there some way to combine those? Well, here would be my guess. I'd say with your real world robot, you'd want to get like a world model such that you can take this thing into simulation. And then it would be just like open AI's automatic domain randomization for how they yeah. solve the Rubik's Cube, how you would, this same curriculum is exactly how they, manipulate the Rubik's cube. So I think, and I also think that it seems like ADR solves SIM to real transfer a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, or, or so I, is, uh, like, yeah. 
this is to Yannick's sort of point earlier is that you, at the end, you have to have sort of the golden environment that you, that you're testing yes. against. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I would believe that you, you create, so there's, there's this trade-off between how many interesting things you get, right? And your goal. Yeah. And maybe, maybe one can create an algorithm where you, you can imagine you first run poet all exploration mode, right? And then at a certain time you put more and more selective pressure on the environment, not the agent, mm -hmm. but the environment to conform more and more towards the environment that you want to perform well. So yeah, it would be like branching and then kind of converging on that environment. So over time you would like have, you would put on the pressure for the environment mm. to, to go there, yeah. right? That's and, a good and idea. There, so, so this, I can imagine something like this might work if you actually had a goal in mind, right? That's but good. Of, of course, can that I, would be I, like um, another, Sorry, another hyperparameter to tune. Uh, of <laughs> yeah. Ah, well, what's one more when we already have a million? You know. Sure. Um, so uh, another interesting observation that I had. Uh, again, uh, I was speaking with uh, Matthew uh, and and uh, his colleague Ilya Karmanov recently, and we were getting into the various different types of symmetries and different manifolds and different inductive priors that that have been encoded into uh, neural network architectures. And I guess what was um, kind of uh, jumping out to me was that the complete lack of those things in this architecture. So there must be some obvious symmetries um, in these environments. So, for example, what happens if you if you mirrored the the mountain structure, or what happened if you did some rotations, or or, or so on? And it would be possible to create inductive priors to to capture these. And not only that, um, because of the way it's using some kind of a um, a, a population based um, optimization system, time in some set in some sense is being collapsed because there are planning variants of reinforcement learning that you know like maze solving is the canonical example so this doesn't really even appear to be um, learning from delayed rewards in a direct sense it's almost like a, a side effect of this population optimization so it, i guess the question is on the one hand it seems like inductive priors are a good thing but is that antithetical to open-endedness well, there's still a lot of inductive priors that go into the CPPN environment encoding. Like if you don't put a, if you don't wrap it in like a sine or a cosine function, it'll like, imagine like X squared is the environment being the final, like it's just boom, you know, so that's where I think inductive priors actually do still like, it's not like no priors in this algorithm. I don't think. Yeah, there's always priors, whether you, whether you make them explicit or not, they're there. True that. But I think, um, the reason why you don't necessarily need uh, to have priors uh, in this is because the problem domain isn't huge enough to require you to restrict it. Like priors are in essence restricting. And whether this is, you're, you're making assumptions, as you said, you know, the equivariance, um, you know, when you're making these various assumptions about how everything is, you're basically saying, okay, model don't care about this. Whereas in the open-endedness, you're like, okay, I, I don't want to, I want to minimize that as much as possible because I don't want to bias my model. I'll just let it explore. So they are slightly antithetical, but they can be used to kind of um, improve matters in, in situations where it's um, intractable. Interesting. Well, a, a huge prior in this kind of work, I believe, is is smoothness in various forms. Uh, yes, for example, in the in the environment encoding, you're you're relying on the fact that if I change my uh, seed value of the environment a little bit, then the environment itself will only change a little bit. Otherwise, you have almost no chance, right? Yeah. You wanna you wanna say if I do a small mutation, probably I'm gonna get a a small change in the environment that yes. my agent can still solve, right? So yes. And likewise, on the agent side, if you do this evolutionary step uh, optimization, you you also wanna say if if I change my parameters a little bit, then it's going to act somewhat differently. So I believe this this smoothness it's in, co in this environment and also on the agent side is probably the biggest prior that that you you have in this, which makes sense, right? But yes, still, absolutely, that, that is. Yeah, I guess I guess the key there is is and this is pointed out is that uh, you know, like Connor said, since we're constructing the environment, we're we're in a way, alleviating the need for so many inductive priors. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. we're already constraining huge, the environment. Mm -hmm. But it's still a huge step from poet to enhance poet on less priors in the environment, which, which yes. I think is really interesting because 
yeah, like maybe it, it's kind of like something that I'm curious about, like if anyone has a little bit of a better understanding of these CPPN networks is like, how much does it really differ to use a CPPN to encode the environment compared to having like another parameterized neural network? So, you know, like a neural network that just maps from X to Y. Is it like they seem really similar to me? I, I don't really see the difference. Yeah, I haven't read the CPPN paper because, again, I think that's Kenneth Stanley's paper um, on CPPN. I, I would assume it'd be similar, but then that's just a guess. I think your your um, assumption is correct. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they just they insert functions and they insert weights to the functions. I guess maybe like having the functions or I think maybe in the CPN, the intermediate functions are a little easier to discover than say like mm -hmm. constructing sign by wrapping it through like two hidden node layers or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe you're right. Is it, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. But they, they have another paper that I think is really interesting when you're thinking about how do you go from poet and bipedal walking agents to something like image classification and supervised learning, which is yep. their paper, Generative Teaching Networks, which <laughs> is where they're creating a data set. And this data set is like, it looks like nonsense, but apparently you train on that data set for like 10 steps and you can get like 90% accuracy on a test set. So like where, no matter how fully fledged that idea is, there's definitely something interesting within generative teaching networks and then these kind of frameworks, I think. Yeah, uh, Connor, just for the benefit of the uh, the audience, can you give a little bit more flavor on generative teaching networks? Sure, generative teaching networks is like this meta learning framework where you have the teacher is producing a data set. So it's like, it's got a generator architecture where it goes from latent vector Z into high dimensional images. And it produces this whole data set that is then evaluated on how quickly it can train the classifier to perform well on a held out validation set. And then once you finish the inner loop with the validation set, you take that to the test set and you say, okay, we discovered this data set, you train it on it, and now you got 90% accuracy on this test set. But, you know, hopefully not too biased with, you know, obviously the data splitting in that is in the inner loop validation test set is maybe a problem, but... So then the interesting thing about it also is that the data set produced by generative teaching networks, it does not look like MNIST or CVAR 10. It's kind of like random noise. It almost looks like, not quite random, but it's like the first GAN you've ever trained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because uh, one of the main limitations of machine learning has been access to uh, training data um, effectively. And, and um, some of these interesting uh, architectural patterns that, that might come out of this are, are really interesting. Any, I, I can't, anytime someone brings up images now, I can't help but think about these adversarial image kind of, kind of uh, attacking, you know, uh, methods, right? That we went over a paper one day. How can I create an image that looks like static and makes everybody think it's a, or all the algorithms think it's a hot dog? You know, yeah. I want, I want to see a test with, with Poet where if we put in a particular little shape on the ground, it just always falls down no matter, no matter what, <laughs> you know, that would be an interesting test. Well, yes. the, the, I, I, these, yeah. these data sets, sorry, and these, sorry, these data ahead. sets that these 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 teaching networks come up with probably have a very intrinsic connection to adversarial examples mm -hmm. yep. because yep. at least in in certain researchers' view of adversarial examples, they 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 kind of are just low low magnitude features in the data and that's probably exactly what these teaching networks produce right they just yep. produce data that just contains these features that are most indicative of the of whatever class you're you're yours right and and that exactly. might not be what you as a human see yeah. so so maybe there's there's a very intrinsic connection i'm pretty sure that it, it, the poet it will it will do the same thing, right? It will have some very subtle features that it pays attention to, and then you'll be able to just put that one feature there, and it'll just completely go off the rails. Uh, That's why I want to see more investment into this. Uh, what, what we call it again, the uh, neural architecture surge, right? Which is, you know, what's the little group of nodes that's leading to this decision? You know, oh, it's looking at a yellow line next to a black line or a boundary between yellow and black. It must be a school bus, you know, that type of thing. Like, let's look at these little features and really dive into them. You know, let's not just completely rip humans out of the feature set 
sort of engineering phase. Let's let's try to work together, right, and see what's going on. I'd well, love I, to see more work on that. Well, I think there there's a lot of literature kind of around this uh, has mainly established that the kind of uh, stuff that we get on adversarial examples that we can't see is mainly high frequency. And it's because we can't perceive it. It's just not possible for a human to perceive it. And the question then becomes is that if you guide a machine to be like a human, to, to kind of see like a human, you're make you're basically trying to imbue it with it the human logic and understanding. But it doesn't mean that because it's using this high frequency information, it's wrong. Um, and, you know, papers have done this kind of investigation have found that these features seem to generalize. So why do they generalize? It, no one's quite sure. We can't introspect it ourselves from our point of view because we don't use that piece of information. So I think you might be right to kind of imbue it with like the certain understanding of how a human does things. But on the other side of things, it may put us into a bottleneck that is kind of like, you know, the way that we see the world. Well, I think this is intimately, you know, connected to parsimony. In, in my opinion, you know, we we've let our we've let our machine learning run far too amok into the massive parameter space with absolutely no parsimony whatsoever. And and I mean, you know, the universe for all its complexity it seems to be based on very simple laws, right? Like like second order differential equations or whatever. And if we don't yeah. structure in this simplicity and this parsimony, I think we're going to keep having these kinds of problems. Like like the Uber car is going to run somebody over because they had a keychain that had a certain shape. You know, we got to get away from that. There's a couple of issues there because uh, I was watching Yannick's video about the, um, the project the Turing. You know, the the huge language model for Microsoft, and and you can say when did World War Two end, and it will say, oh, you know, it ended in 1945. And it's gotten to the point now where it, you know it might just be memorizing uh, particular uh, you know passages in, in various different documents on on the internet. But this parsimony thing is really interesting that you're talking about, Keith, because uh, when I was talking to, to to Matthew about the lottery ticket hypothesis uh, paper, um, it was almost saying that the, um, the the parsimony is all you really need. The parameterization is almost something that is required just for optimization for stat, you know for uh, SGD uh, you know in in order f- for it to become a tractable convex optimization problem. You need, need to have that mm-hmm. over parameterization, right? And I would say that the the problem that we might have with you know people getting run over by self driving cars is a problem of supervised learning, not necessarily a problem of of having over parameterized networks, because the as you said the if you're able to give and an get the network to kind of figure out what what would be its adversarial examples, then it would be able to train itself on them and not mistake them in the real world. And this is one of the things that we also see is that we see a lot of people using synthetic data because you can have perfect control of the world and you can basically get it to, to kind of simulate every kind of possible um, environment and then basically train the model on it. And now if you kind of took a, a kind of idea from Gans or a poet where you get the model to kind of teach itself, you know, not to be um, fooled by these adversarial examples, then it would kind of, you know, figure this out. Um, it, it, it'd be interesting to contrast because, uh, you know, we were talking about the adversarial um, uh, um Examples are features, not bugs, right? Yeah. But but are, are, are normal um, uh, neural networks that are highly parameterized and have lots of inductive priors, are they more or less susceptible to adversarial attacks than this poet architecture? Uh, that's a hard question. <laughs> well, it, it depends. It depends entirely on how the how the agent in poet is parameterized, right? Yes. It, like ultimately, the agent in poet is a, a very classic. You can you can make it a linear function, or you can make it a neural network. Um, ultimately, each agent has a policy function, and that policy function, if it is a neural network, we can attack it with an adversarial example almost surely. Right. If it is not explicitly trained to to avoid that, I'd be very surprised if not. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Agreed. Well, why don't we move the conversation a little bit to um, some of the uh, the engineering mechanics of Poet? Because uh, in your review video, uh, Yannick, you were talking about being surprised by the amount of hyperparameters, and yeah, and you thought that it was um, a little bit fiddly. You know, there might be an issue there with reproducibility. And and could you also describe the the time complexity of the algorithm? You know, would it scale? What would happen if there were more uh, environments? Is does more mean better, etc.? Well, more is 
better in this case uh more environments more agents would mean better unless you kept your compute constant right as as far as i understand it their evolving set of agents they remove the oldest ones just because they they just can't physically run them all at the same time and if i recall correctly they have something like 40 agents at any given time uh so it's not this might be wrong but i think it's about the order of magnitude so they don't have tens of thousands they just they have a couple that they keep around and if the new one joins they drop out the old one so i in terms of time complexity i mean you have you in each step you need to go over every single agent mutate it then you need to test every other agent on that new environment right to estimate the transfer thing and then you need for everyone you need to do an evolution step which means you need to noise uh, perturb all of the parameters in uh, in a couple of ways and then check which one's the best right so there is like inner loop and inner loop and inner loop in this in this al algorithm it's not it's not exponential per se but it is it is very uh, consuming of resources and and each one of these things you need to tune right so there is uh how many steps do i take um in the inner optimization then how how what's the step size there what's the learning rate what's the noise uh, and then after how many steps do i check the agents where is the cutoff for it's too easy where is the cutoff for it's too hard and so on this this is just extreme extremely um, labor intensive from an engineering perspective. The enhanced yeah. poet solves some of these issues where it introduces it introduces kind of, for example, this notion of novelty. It it really defines okay. Here is when we here is a generic way to say something is novel, which I find really cool. But still, there are so many many parameters in this that. It, I think it takes it takes an engineering team to really get something like this running, and it takes a cluster, right? It, it's not like you could run this algorithm at home. You need, I think, the first one was done at Uber AI, uh, and um, yeah, you you need a distributed uh, cluster to to run this. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, mean that, that was my. Uh, mentioned sorry, in the paper that uh, the the point run, I think, is the new one, takes twelve days. On yeah. 750 CPUs, yeah, <laughs> and that's the optimized one. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I, I, with all of this research and all of this area, like you know, Alpha Zero, etc., the compute is always going to be prohibitive, and so it's yeah, it's going to be very hard to replicate um, and extrapolate necessarily. Yeah, because I, I suppose to, to use or to, to abuse terminology, is it kind of similar to data parallel? So pre presumably, that in order to, to to make this work, they created a distributed version of it, and they did some kind of um, you know they they did the ES uh, policy update after all of the respective agents had finished, uh, possibly in a distributed setting. I don't know whether they expanded on how they did that. Well, there's definitely some parallel part in the algorithm, so you can run a lot of part uh, concurrently. So I think it's helped a lot, and you can distribute this one quite nicely comparing to other um, RL algorithms that are in a, in in their core serialized. Serial like you need the, the previous result to go on. Yes, if you compare again to to evolution. Uh, it's in evolution the, the more things you produce the more compute you have available right but in essence it is all parallel it evolution is parallel parallelizable and this algorithm in exactly the same way it has no central thing right that 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 needs to like uh, if you distribute your data and then you need to collect the updates it mm -hmm. doesn't have that you can distribute the final as step. much as you want it has yeah. it in the final step of selecting the next population, but that's that even true. That's yes. even sort you, of an optimization. You wouldn't even yes. you could do without that as well. Exactly. Yeah. So you can you can parallelize, and then you need a synchron synchronization. So yeah, all of the agents have to run. Point, yeah. At some point, you got to get an answer, I guess. Which is, that's what I really liked about Yannick's idea of like, can we find some way to start funneling them back towards? what we're trying to solve, you know, mm -hmm. at, the, yeah. at the end, that would be a very interesting way, being interesting to do that other than just the simplistic way of, let me just take the best one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and mean, even that, maybe that environment. Uh, sorry, sorry, just because 
the cross you keep it maybe there, there needs to be some heuristics as well because in theory one agent on one environment could take a year to run so we're not going to wait for it to run maybe we have a, a timeout and maybe if several agents have already come in with a really good time we just terminate the other agents because we're not going to bother waiting for them again it just sort of raises some interesting heuristics to optimize it well, that's all buried in those hyperparameters that Yannick's talking about, except the thresholds here and there and whatever. But right now, they're just, they've got some very coarse ones. Like, let's chop it down to 40. You know? <laughs> I don't know why they didn't choose 42. I would have gone with 42 yeah. personally, but... Always, always a magic number. Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, I think it's half... Like, we are halfway because it's like, like we're doing a meeting with the other... We are brainstorming with new ideas and generate new new data, new space, new experience, and new conclusion. And we evolve with that. We create skills with that. But the second part is missing. Like, okay, and like you said, what do I have to? What do I do with my fifteen agent that was successful? We have to summarize and and have a way to get down to lower dimension dimensionality and all that complexity to have some kind of a not one answer, but to reduce to something usable. So I think we are halfway there. There must be new papers on how to reduce all that generating stuff to generate, degenerate the envi this environment to something usable, more practical. Sounds like a good thesis topic. Any any takers <laughs> on the call? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah. Well, I think uh -huh. just the idea that it keeps getting more complex, even though the, the new transfer objective is just to reorder the ranking of the agent. So it's interesting that, like, let's say you have this complex terrain that all the 40 agents are walking on, and then you might be able to come up with some terrain that's less complex, and they would reorder the agents, and then your environment survives the evolution selection. So just that the fact that that cycling doesn't happen, which happens all the time in GANs, you have the like catastrophic forgetting and discriminator and you cycle yeah. and it doesn't get better. It gets worse. So I think just the fact that, you know, even though I don't know in the paper, if they take their final agent on the most complex terrain and then say, Hey, look, you can also do all these other terrains. I think that's the one thing in the paper that is really lacking is that you don't see that. Like not only can you not optimize this with ES or PPO directly, but this final agent can do all these things. And I don't yeah. think any paper actually achieves something like that, even though like, like in the open AI hide and seek agents, they try to then construct these six easier tasks. And it's like, it's not better at those tasks. It's maybe like a little bit yeah. better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah it's that's like a very, really good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's like really a, good a good point about that. For example, um, I believe the annex said that they kind of throw away the oldest population, like simple alternative might be, well, let, let's keep the best ones along with the ones that are second best in, in every environment or, or the ones that do well across several environments, like just a better sort of sorting strategy would be interesting. I think, yeah, that's, this has been a topic within evolutionary um, algorithms and genetic programming for quite a while. And I've seen a lot of uh, ways in which they do that. Um, it always becomes a problem with computation. So the more you retain, the more computation, the more expensive, and like what payoff do you get for doing that? Um, if there was a way, I think the key to this is being able to extract from each of the agents or each of the environments what is important uh, and that's that's the key problem here because if you were able to kind of instead of having to take the whole agent or the whole environment you're able to take a sub piece and put it with whatever else to something that you were saying earlier then that's the part that would be useful and that's why i like the idea of the agent and the environment being part of some genome now if you split this even further and you basically were able and you had multiple multiple components that in isolation would still work Work, then you begin to have something that becomes a bit more powerful in the sense that you can optimize individual components and they still will work together. Um, but again, that's uh, coming up with that and how to kind of do that is super hard. I like the I like the maybe the introduction here of this um, alpha star. They have this concept of the league training. Um, so in, in Alpha Star, it tries to solve StarCraft, and it has very different agents. It has some of the agents, they just learn the game. But the mm -hmm. other agents, they're trying to explicitly come up with strategies to exploit these, right? And, and that just kind of keeps those always kind of remembering, oh, yes, I need to, I need to you know, be able to defend against this strategy and against this strategy. So they have these single exploiters that, that always try to, to attack them. So if, if the, these ever forget, 
then it's catastrophic for them, right? So they, it, yeah. it keeps them it keeps them on their feet. And there there should be like a notion like this could come into this poet framework where you basically you're not saying like okay. I'll forget about you, agent, but it's I'll keep you around. You can teach the other ones what you know. But yeah, of yeah. course, it's very hard to to implement something mm -hmm. like well, that. That's like the, the notion from these, you know, the the um, the rock paper scissors AI competition that used to be around. I think it's it's no longer a thing, but people would create programs to play rock paper scissors. Now, rock paper scissors is a pretty boring game if everybody plays the optimal randomized solution, right? But if you seed the field with exploitable agents, now you have a much more interesting problem because now you're trying to come up with an algorithm that wins more from the exploitable guys without losing too much to, to the, you know, I just going to choose one third rock, paper, scissors, right? And uh, so like you're saying, when you have a field that has different types of agents, exploitable ones or ones that go after particular strategies, it's a much more, you know, complex terrain. By the way, that's also how you solve the the problem in GANs of um, of these of these kind of collapses. Is there is actually work by my colleague from my lab that where you kind of remember the old the old GANs that you have around, and you always use them to kind of influence the newest ones, and and then you can you can mitigate this exactly the same basically as poet does. You remember the population. Yeah, I, I don't think catastrophic forgetting is happening in Poet too much. Just on that same reasoning behind, if the if the ranking order was shifting dramatically, then I think it would cycle. And I don't think it. Yeah, it's, I don't know if it has a history, like some kind of memory of the previous terrains that, like you know, like having like a replay buffer for Gans or. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know if Poet uses something like that. <laughs> But yeah, I don't think just the fact that it doesn't constantly shift the rank order or and then, you know, thus get simpler, I think says that it's not catastrophic for getting problem. But I definitely think the paper needs that discussion of like, here's what happens when we take it and put it on an easier environment compared to the other ones or something like that, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, in essence, you're, you're basically asking for some sort of generalization, right? You, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. you kind of get, you kind of optimize to this kind of really difficult situation, but is is it just another way of optimizing to a final solution, which is that final environment, which we have no idea of, or is it that it's a generalizable solution? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so folks, any more burning? Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on, Connor. Well, I, well another, another thing... Oh, no. Well, yeah, no, I was just going to say uh, that it's interesting to think about, like, connecting poet with, like, self-supervised learning and then just thinking generally about this agent environment relationship, like, to think about how general this kind of coevolution idea can be. Like, we saw the generative teaching network idea where you can generate data sets. You could also, like, self-supervised learning. You could, the environment could be what constructs these artificial labels from the data. So I'm just curious on like what your miscellaneous like what all your thoughts are on how you would take some framework like this and then put it into a more understood problem like supervised learning performance. Like how would you use Poet to get better ImageNet classification? Mm -hmm. Yannick, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I no. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 this is exactly this is a problem we started with, right? You you have this more and more powerful algorithms but you're giving away more and more the power to choose what comes out of them. And here you, you somehow have to reintroduce this power that you say, I want a good image net classifier, right? This is my goal. And it is a direct, in direct conflict with what this algorithm is good at. Um, and if, if you could combine that, I, I believe that there's definitely a way. And I believe that this could be this branching and then uh, funneling together by after a while putting a selective pressure on the goal that you want. I don't yeah. know any other forms at the moment. Because there is something to be said for, I mean, for example, well, there's uh, lots of unsupervised learning algorithms for, I mean, we all know about the, the famous self-supervised transformers models in NLP, but there are similar things in computer vision as well. Like uh, there's the Deep Info Max paper, you know, by Devon Yelm. And, you know, that that's a similar kind of self-supervision. And that can learn really, really powerful um, representations that are in some ways even better than ones created from supervised classifiers because they essentially haven't been uh, supervised. It does make me think that 
would a similar thing be possible if you had a computer vision ver- version of Poet and you let it self play and co and, and co evolve with a with a with a curriculum? Would it learn some kind of powerful internal representations that then could be taken out of that context and to help us in a, in, a, in an entirely different predictive architecture? Uh, the question yeah, that I, I would pose. Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, like, back to the idea of like information loss within the population. Like, one cool idea would be like to ensemble the population. So, let's say you want to come up with the most complex terrain that no agent could ever walk on. What you would do, I think, is like append the terrains to each other and then switch the controllers at each next terrain, and then you'd be walking across this crazy terrain, just switching the controller. So like maybe something with ImageNet classification, they each have a subset of the data that is different enough from each other that you combine this ensemble and then bang, it's like got ImageNet. Yeah, and that's very yeah. interesting. I would say for, to the point of like the ImageNet and Poet, uh, I would say the problem there is that you you would allow it to explore the domain, but you've got to find the model that is the this you know super ImageNet model. How how do you find that? Yeah, you've explored this huge space, but how do you know? You know, you can get better at like you can tell it you know to make harder and harder tasks. So like like transformations on the images, and you kind of becomes better at doing that. But you are still guided to a final point. There is no way to say that it, this is a generalizable solution. And I think that's the open question. I have an idea. Yeah. yeah. Poet, <laughs> for tw- poet for Twitter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> can, you, can you develop this idea a little bit further? Already on it. <laughs> get as most get as get max retweets. Max retweets. <laughs> oh, wow. And then an idea was born. Uh, it sounds sounds like some sort of virus that's going to kind of decimate social networks. <laughs> yeah, the, the Twitter worm of twenty twenty. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Socially engineered Twitter worm, yeah, Twitter poet, exactly. Well, in essence, it's kind of like the meme theory from um, oh, what's his name. So, in essence, you want a meme to propagate. So, in order for it to propagate, it has to kind of improve itself. And so, <laughs> by doing this kind of evolution, eventually, you'll end up with this super meme. Um, so, your su- super Twitter post. <laughs> You could probably train it with reinforcement learning, like in the fine tuning with language models, and then just reward its retweets. Yeah, works. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, it'd be so bad. That is a brilliant idea, though. Um, anyway, you might folks, get so banned with, uh, from Twitter for doing that. You, to, you better be careful which account you do that from. I know they. <laughs> somebody, well somebody will box terms. you. <laughs> Anyway, folks, so we've been talking for about an hour and 10 minutes. I, I think it's, it's been a fantastic conversation. Uh, it, it's, it's gone really, really well, actually. I'm, I'm really, really chuffed with it. So um, I guess we better close it out now because we don't want to bore our listeners. But we will be back next week. And we are planning to explore loads and loads of different types of content. It doesn't just have to be paper conversations. We can talk about interesting articles or, you know, any controversy that's going on in the in the Twitter verse at the moment. Um, you know, it's just an opportunity for us to have a conversation. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you, Bye. folks. Good being here. Bye.